I bet you're feeling pretty chuffed recently. Um, I mean, at the time of recording this, um, the Borstal EP, At Her Majesty Pleasure, came out about four days ago. So I'm guessing that was a big weight off your chest. Dude, it's, everybody's been so impatient over that moment. Everybody's been so impatient. It, it feels like it's took forever. But essentially, we put it all together really quickly. Like the whole process was really quick. But I think we're just, uh, you know, when, you're, when people are sat at home feeling, uh, <laughs> feeling tired and bored and this, that, and the other, you've got nothing to think about. But then, like, man, I wish this was out, you know. But it's good, man. It's good. We're on point. Absolutely. Like um, what I was because with the EP itself, because with Borstal as a whole, it, it essentially on the surface, it looks like a bit of a super group because you got, you know, the probably the face of UK hardcore Pierre fronting it. You got you yeah. guys, you and Lee from Drip Back. Um, uh, you've got <sighs> his name escapes me from King of Pigs, I think it was. Um, yeah, Jamie from King of Pigs. Yeah. And then, and I think this is probably the big unique selling point was uh, Nick Barker on drums. Um, and Nick is, well, he's had a very long storied career throughout sort of, you know, international metal because he drummed originally from Cradle of Filth and moved to Dimmenborg gear. And he's had stunts sessioning for all kinds of bands, Testament, Brugera currently. Uh, and there was that project he had with Lockout with members of Napalm Death as well. Fucking fantastic band. Um, yeah, that's my favorite one of his, actually, bro. That's the one. It, it is quite tasty, I got to say. Um, yeah, I mean, how did that all come about? This sort of, you know, basically forming this. I think it is safe to say, call it a sort of a super group of sorts. Yeah, well, you know what? It's funny. It's funny when you say super group because I don't, I don't really see... Uh, I don't really see it from that angle because essentially it's just people from other bands getting and do, you know, like every, everybody does that, don't they? Yeah. Um, you know, when you, when you spend so much time like uh, in playing in bands and, uh, you know, going and going to shows, different areas that I've lived and so on and so on, then it, it just becomes a normal thing. But me and Nick have been, uh, me, Nick and Lee have been friends for like about, about 15 years or so. Um, and we always just meet, used to meet up at like you know, musical events or whatever, or just try and find a time to hang out, um, chat shit and whatever. Um, and, and, uh, he wanted to do something, um, wasn't, didn't know who we wanted to do it with and whatever. And he just mentioned it to me and, uh, Lee and we just jumped straight on it just started doing demos, you know, like we were well interested to do something and see, see where it came in and Lee right with it really well together. Um, and then uh, Pierre, that was just a, uh, you know, Barker's, Barker's like, right, who's who's good? It's like, this guy. <laughs> it's like, do you know him? Yeah. Give them a call. And he said yes straight away. We just got, I think we got Pierre at the right time, you know. There was not a lot going on. He was in between records and stuff. Like, uh, um, time. So that was good. And now he's stuck in it. <laughs> I made an offer he can't um, refuse. And Jamie, I've known Jamie since I was about. <laughs> and uh, Jamie, I know Jamie since I was about uh, 14, 15. Yeah. Uh, back, we're both from Grimsby. And uh, uh, up until I left um, when I was 18, um, I was going to all the metal shows there. And J- Jamie was James a bit older than me. They were always cool to us kids when we were going to the shows, like 14, 15, 16. And. Uh, and we just stayed in touch from there. Like me and Lee are both big, big fans of King of Pigs as well, man. So that's a real cool band. Check them out. Um, I mean, I've listened to the EP. Um, it's not long since about, but my takeaway from it was that it had a, a very old school vibe to it. It reminded me a lot of sort of like your your New York, New York hardcore bands, even like early ones, like uh, you know, Agnostic Front from the 80s, uh, Cro-Mags and Parts, Crumb Suckers, uh, early sick of it all as well. Um, there was a definite, there was a definite sort of aim with this. It, it has a lot more in common with, I'd say it's a lot more punk than it is sort of contemporary hardcore. And you know what? It's kind of refreshing to hear that in, in the sort of a classical sense. That's nice to hear, man. Um, I mean, it, for us, it was just what, what came out naturally. It, to be honest, like we wanted to do something that was more faced, uh, more uh, focused on that like 80s 90s style like poison idea is a big big one of mine oh yeah great um, you know and and obviously lee grew up with a lot of oil stuff 
Um, I listen to a, I listen to a hell of a lot of D beat, cross punk and stuff like that. Um, and so to to take all of those elements and put it into the Barker saying, I want to do stuff that sounds like this, this, and this. It's like sweet because that's what we're doing. We're not reinventing the wheel. We're just we're just pre- playing the music that we all appreciate. You know. Well, it looked like it pretty much came at the right time as well. And uh, it's interesting to note that, yeah, a lot of this was, I remember you saying before that it, Nick Barker as well, especially had a, a, a real interest in sort of getting on to into that scene as well. I mean, for a man who's basically done pretty much all extremes in, in metal, I guess, I'm guessing this is kind of a break for him in some respects. It doesn't require like 200, 300 BPM sort of blast per minute. It's a bit more straightforward. <laughs> Yeah, that's true. That's true. Um, I, I, I can imagine that it's a little bit easier. But saying that, he, like he uh, he, he puts uh, he puts everything into everything he does. So you know, I'm no sure doubt. it's gonna wear. It's sure it's gonna wear him out after after a forty minute set or whatever. <laughs> you know what I mean? Also, uh, I mean, yeah. talking of, talking about the changes for him as well. Like, imagine, uh, like imagine playing all these. We've been talking about this, like play, playing hardcore shows. Because you know, yeah, sure. Like, if, like you see wild crowds and stuff, and especially I'm sure with Brujeria, they've got people coming on stage and this, that, and the other. But playing some of these hardcore shows in England on like a couple of pallets on the floor, like that should be pretty wild, man. Like protecting yeah. the kit, <laughs> <laughs> just to prevent pylons. <laughs> yeah, like I, I would, I would happily say, like as a as a punter and gone to plenty of shows, like plenty of Russian shows and even sort of festivals abroad as well. Yeah, hardcore shows are a whole other thing. You know, probably anything can happen. Anything can happen, you know? Yeah, bro. <laughs> you know, whereas like other musical genres would show some restraint, I think, you know, you're not going to get that all the time with this, this genre of music. So yeah, I hope you've, you've briefed them on that, especially when you do eventually take this live, which I assume <laughs> you are. Uh, he was he was going to metal shows uh, in the UK in the eighties, so he's seen his fair share of carnage as well. Yeah, I'm sure. You know what I mean? Yeah, um, I was going to mention this before because you touched upon it as well. The um, and this is a very unique thing that sort of happened at the end of the EP was the um, the King of the jo- Jungle cover. Now that was actually written by your guitarist Lee's dad, Arthur Kitchener, right? Yeah, that's like a four yeah, year old right. song, basically. I mean, yeah, yeah, please, he's four years old, I believe. <laughs> Well, I mean, um, the the record that it comes off um, is is a banging record anyway. Like there's there's loads. Like uh, if you look back to other hardcore things, I can't remember if it was Sick of It All or Mabel did uh, um, did a cover of the last last result. I mean, there's been so many bands that, that do that sort of stuff. But King of the Jungle was uh, was an obvious choice, like because it's. That was obviously Lee's favorite, and he's just like, right, this is what we're doing, you know. Like, I'm, everybody just jumped to it. It was, it was, uh, it was a really, really nice vibe actually to to have that as the cover, you know. Like, well, not only that, you, about... you got the man himself on there as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That that was a given, man. I uh, respect to Arthur for that, but it was, uh, yeah, that was a given, man. We had to ask. <laughs> No, man, like I like the, the whole package you sort of brought out as well in that entire EP. Like by the time I finished listening to it, well, I'm actually I wanted to listen to it again, but deep down inside I wanted more. I was just like, oh, this is done. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, we we talked about that as well. Like, to be honest, I think like this um this record is pretty much like it's 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 short, sharp, and sweet. We wanted to put something out there to sort of say, yo, what's up? We're here. Um take advantage of the time that we had um with with all this like lockdown stuff and all of that crazy shit like right okay there's people stuck at home we could we can be you know i was flying back and forth in between things and basically like registering my quarantine so like i was registered as as in quarantine at, at charlie's rehearsal room a recording studio sorry so, um, yeah, I was going to say that it was, probably was a logistical challenge of its own. Yeah, dude, like yeah, bouncing about like that was was crazy. But um, but we just took every advantage of every option and angle that we had, and we got shit done really quick. And we had like I think we had two rehearsals. We had one with Pedro, um, but uh, yeah, I think two full rehearsals, 
and then uh, and then that was it. We were in the we were in the studio, and we were still changing shit then. Um, but we, yeah, we we got it done, um, and then it was like this long process of trying to get it out, which is uh, when you're doing it on your own. Well, say you like when Lee's doing it on his own, because that's pretty much how it's been. Yeah, it's hard work. Um, is that independently through um, the label that you put it on for Family Records? Yeah, we did the first uh, we did the first two drip back ones on that as well. Um, solely for the fact that it was it was a nicer feeling, like knowing that you're going to be able to move them, or at least you know, hoping like uh, you know with with a very positive uh, um, approach that you're going to get rid of how many you press. Then uh, we we just did it, and obviously like, we did it with the first two drip uh, the, the drip back album and the second EP. And so we just continued that. But now Lee secured, uh, we have uh, distro through, um, um, we've got European distro through uh, Cortex. And, nice. uh, and that's nice to be a, for them to do it as well, because we highly respect that record label um, and store. And uh, we've also got uh, distro with Cargo as well. So cargo's handling most of our distro. So mm-hmm. we're we're stoked, man. We're stoked to have it out there and have it look semi-professional. Lee's done all the work to make that happen. And uh yeah, we're stoked to get it out there, bro. Finally. Yeah. It's not even out, it's not even on people's doorsteps yet, but still. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You gotta it's those vinyl orders and those special CDs. It's the logistics of fulfilling all the physical copies of the album. That takes a bit of time. But hey, you guys did it, you know. You, Put in the work yeah. and put in the infrastructure. <laughs> yeah, as I say, it's, it's it's all respect to Lee, man, because not not we haven't been able to go down and help him, or you know, I'd fly over in a second and help him out. Yeah, um, yeah. But with with all of this shit right now, like it's it's super difficult. So it's been an extra yeah. stress for for my man there. But it's it's uh, you know everybody's listening to it, everybody's digging it. So happy days. That's that's all that matters in the end. That's what your aim is in the beginning, right? So, so what's the plan now for Bristol? Wait till things normalize, get shows booked. Um, well, we're uh, we're booked again. We're booked in the studio for July. Uh, this time with Russ Russell. Um, nice. That's pe- that's penciled in now. Um, uh, solely to the fact that you know, we, we, nobody still really knows what's going on COVID wise. But um, yeah, we're booked in the studio with Russ Russell. We're gonna do uh, we're gonna do a seven inch, uh, just so that we can just crash that out. Um, we got songs ready for that, and then we got half an album of stuff as well. <laughs> it's been a lot of hard work um, putting into putting into demos and stuff. Like me and Lee were bouncing off like one or two demos a week at a certain point. And we just kept everything. We cherry picked bits that we wanted, and we also we sort of cherry picked stuff that we liked. You know, we want to put that on an album. So um, it's been nice to be able to pick and choose. Really, I'm looking forward to it because, based on what I've heard so far, I'm, I'm definitely up for more. 